Okay, so I want to continue the, this discussion about how the margins are inversely related to the slopes or the norms of the function. Um, and also I want to talk a little bit more about how this problem or the way we originally formulated it is ill-posed because there are many functions that have the same decision boundary. So let's start with some definitions. The geometric margin is the Euclidean distance between a point and the decision boundary. So think about the points being distributed in real space and then actually calculating these distances between the point and the line. The unnormalized functional margin is y times f, and then the normalized functional margin is y times the normalized version of f. And as we're going to show, the normalized functional margin and the geometric margin are actually the same thing, depending on our, our choices that we've made. Okay, so I want to get a little bit, I want to show you an example about this ill-posedness, um, and I'm going to show you just with, with the data set here. So this is the data set that I created. It's just a bunch of random points. And um, you can see that they are able to be separated by uh, um, a, a line, right? There's, there's a line that would separate the one class from another class. OK, so in this figure, um, I, all I did was I plotted a classifier okay, that would separate the points. So let me show you a different perspective on that classifier. And in particular, along this vertical axis, I plotted f of x. So you can see that the classifier happily separates the data points into um, positives and negatives. And um, that it's, it's doing so with a particular, there's a particular slope involved here, right? Now, as it turns out, there can be many functions with different slopes that all have the same decision boundary. So I will show you another such function here. And if I rotate that, you can see that I have the function I had before, which is that lower one. And then I have a function that has a, a steeper slope. It has the same decision boundary, it just has a steeper slope. And so that's the problem we were running into before, because if you're going to use y times f as the margin, well, then you can just take that function f and just tip it up so that y times f is as large as you possibly want it to be for any given data point. And that's where the problem was. That's where we got stuck. And so um, the, the way that we sort of suggested to handle it was to take the function and normalize it so that if you have a function of slope 2, well, all of a sudden, um, we're not going to view it as a function of slope 2. We'll view it as a function of slope 1 so that all functions with the same decision boundary actually have sort of one uh, kind of, kind of um, you know, one representative, which is that function with the slope of one. And, and that should resolve the, the ambiguity issue. And then it should resolve the, the, the actual meaning of the margin. Now, as it turns out, um, that actually does a lot when you do that. Um, so let's talk about the fact that there are two ways to eliminate this arbitrariness in this um, definition of the, the margin there. So the first way to eliminate it is, as I mentioned, you could just force the slope to one, or for, force the, the absolute slope to one, which is the same thing as forcing the norm in higher dimensions to be one. And then maximize the geometric margin to the closest data points. So in other words, if you start with uh, a function that has an absolute slope of 2, you just normalize it and then try to choose, a, choose the function, give, given that it's normalized, choose the function to have the largest geometric margin between the, the data point and the line. So it's the largest possible distance between, the, between any point and the decision boundary there. And then um, the, the, that's, the thing is that support factor machines don't actually do that. They do something different. They actually force the minimum functional margin to one and reduce the size of the slope. So it's essentially a very, very different thing. So they take y times f. So f is the unnormalized function. And then they say, okay, let's force all of those unnormalized margins to be at least one. 
And then from there, we will try to make the slope of this line as close to horizontal as possible. So make this thing as flat as possible. So they say, okay, let's flatten it out, flatten it out so that it's as, as flat as possible. And these two kind of mechanisms have the same result. It's really, really interesting. Okay, so in other words, we constrain, create constraints that look like this. We say for all i, y times f is at least one. All right, and that's gonna, and then among that, find the, find this, the, the absolute slope that's the smallest. Okay, so we create these constraints that say for the positives, f of x has to be above one, for the negatives, f of x has to be below minus one, and then you can move around the slope however you like. You just have to make sure that in the end, um, when you minimize the slope, um, you have to obey these constraints that the functional margins are at least one. And then you are minimizing the slope or the, the norm here in this case. Now, as I mentioned before, the definition we chose for gamma forces one forces that gamma equals one over the norm of the lambdas. And so we're actually ending up, we're actually ending up um, um, minimizing that slope by maximizing one over the slope. Okay, so as it turns out, the geometric margin, which is the distance again from the point to the decision boundary, is the same thing as the normalized functional margin. And that's not something that um, that you know, that, that's something I actually have to prove. I actually do have to, have to do some work to show that. So let me um, show you how that works. So there's our, you know, the fact that F is a linear model. I'm going to take away the intercept term just for now. I'll put it back in later. Don't worry. So now the decision boundary are the points X for which lambda dot X is zero. Okay. So what that means is that the inner product between lambda and x is zero. So x is orthogonal to lambda. So that decision boundary consists of x's that are orthogonal to lambda. So that's why when I'm writing the when I when I'm writing the unit vector lambda, it's actually orthogonal to the points that are on the decision boundary. Okay. So I've drawn that unit vector, I've drawn lambda in its correct direction there. And now I'm going to make it a unit vector by normalizing it. Okay, so we call that, that's my unit vector. All right, now I'm going to put the intercept back in. So now the decision boundary are the x's such that lambda dot x plus lambda zero is zero. And then f of x now has its lambda zero. And by doing that, I just, I took the whole function f and I moved it up. You can think of shifting the whole thing up. But I want to preserve the geometric intuition here. So I'm preserving the unit vector, and I'm just going to work with that. I know it's a little confusing, but let's go with the flow here in this case, because that's um, we're going to be working with, again, lambda without the, um, the, the that uh, intercept term gets handled separately by SVM. All right, so now if I take a data point x, it's a positive data point, I want to calculate its geometric margin. Now, to get the geometric margin, it's the distance from x to the point b, which is on that decision boundary. And then the geometric margin is that, I've labeled it there, so it's gamma i geo. Okay. So what's the equation for b? What's the equation that relates b and gamma geo i and x? And it looks like this. So if you start from xi, if you start from xi, and then you walk backward, along the unit vector. So you walk in the negative unit vector direction, and the distance you walk is gamma i geo, you get to the point B. So that's what this says. It says you start from xi, and then you walk negative a distance gamma i geo along that unit vector, and you get to B. Okay, cool. And then um, B obeys another equation because it's sitting on the decision boundary. So I can write this equation that um, that lambda dot b plus lambda zero is zero because b is sitting on the decision boundary and that's the equation for points that live on the decision boundary. Okay, putting those two things together, 
I get that thing right there. So here I just subbed in B. And then I simplified a little bit. And then I solved for gamma IGO. And lo and behold, what I got shockingly is the normalized version of F. Cool. Now, as I mentioned, I had chosen a positive data point. And as it turned out, the calculation would have been exactly kind of symmetric if I had chosen a negative data point. Because if I had chosen a negative data point, I would have walked, instead of walking negative the unit vector, I would have walked along positive unit vector. And so there would have been an additional negative sign that would have been canceled out by the label Y when I put it back in. So it would have worked out if I chose a negative point too. In any case, what I have managed to show is that the geometric margin and the normalized functional margin are the same. They're one and the same. So that's why I can happily talk about the margin without defining which of these two margins I'm talking about. Okay, so what is it then that we're maximizing again? It's some sort of gamma, right? What is gamma? So gamma here is the, is the minimum normalized functional margin, okay? So we say maximize gamma such that all the points including the minimum. So all the points have, have normalized functional margin, at least gamma. Okay, so I, all I did was change, uh, let me go back and do that again. So here, I just, I'm just gonna move the norm to the other side there. Okay, so the norm of F is on the other side. And then our scaling choice is to force that uh, norm of F times gamma equal to one. And this simply defines gamma with a scale. Like I, could have, like I said, I, I could have chosen 10, I could have chosen 15, it doesn't matter. I just chose one for convenience. Okay, and then uh, because of that choice and because F is a linear model, so its norm is you know, the L2 norm of lambda, then um, I have gamma equals one over that norm. And so since I'm maximizing one over gamma, sorry, Wow, since I'm maximizing gamma, <laughs> I'm maximizing one over the norm of lambda, and that's the same thing as minimizing the norm of lambda. In fact, um, we're not just gonna minimize the norm of lambda, we're gonna minimize the norm of lambda squared because when you minimize something squared, it's the same as minimizing that same thing, as long as it's you know, non-negative, so that's, that's fine, we're allowed to do that. Okay, so what we've gotten to is that we're minimizing that norm squared, uh, such that the uh, unnormalized margins are all forced to be at least one. Okay, thank you very much.